people have this conception of the left and the right where the left has a particular worldview and the right has a particular worldview. And what makes you left or right is whether you agree with this worldview or that worldview. And you're saying, no, that is, that's totally wrong. Liberalism and conservatism, we don't believe exist. Um, what we find is what they're calling liberalism and conservatism is simply one position associated with liberal or conservative. It's not that they're born with a disposition to be against tax cuts and be uh, in favor of more COVID restrictions and born with a disposition to be against the Iraq war. It's that there's one issue, gay rights, that is more associated with the left-wing tribe. And so they're more likely to join the Democratic Party, anchor into that tribe, and adopt the rest of the mm. decisions. Some people are born more individualist, more libertarian, more get out of my way, don't bother me. And so those people, if you believe strongly in free markets, you're going to anchor into the right wing tribe. Disposition to one issue is sufficient to get you to anchor into a tribe and adopt the rest. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guests today are Hiram and Verlin Lewis. Hiram and Verlin are brothers. One is an associate professor of history at Brigham Young University, Idaho, and the other is a political scientist at Harvard Center for American Political Studies. Together, Hiram and Verlin have written a very interesting new book called The Myth of Left and Right, How the Political Spectrum Misleads and Harms Americans. In this book, they challenge the widely held belief that the political left and right represent two distinct philosophies, liberalism or progressivism on one end and conservatism on the other. Instead, they argue that people on the left and the right are more like sports fans. They are born into a particular tribe, and then they adopt the random assortment of beliefs that that tribe currently holds. Now, they acknowledge that there are such things as political philosophies, like libertarianism, for example. They just think those philosophies have nothing to do with what we call the left and the right in everyday speech. In other words, the words left and right do not name philosophies. They name arbitrary tribes that then invent convenient but false stories about what their philosophies are. That thesis is the topic of this conversation, and I think it's very interesting. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope you do too. So without further ado, Hiram and Verlin Lewis. Okay, Verlin and Hiram Lewis, thanks so much for coming on my show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so this is this marks the first time that I have a pair of siblings on the show, and I was I was just telling you before I didn't know much about you, but I read your book, The Myth of Left and Right, and I saw two people with the same last name and assumed it would be a, a husband and wife, as 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 is more common, <laughs> actually. But uh, your brothers. So before we get into your your book about political tribalism and the, the real source of the difference between the left and the right. Uh, can you just give my audience a little sense of who, who are you guys? How did you come to, you know, be brothers interested in the same topics and, uh, and then eventually write a book together? Yeah, maybe I could jump in on that one. I'm a little older than Verlin. And so when I was in graduate school, I was my advisor was pushing me to write about the history of conservatism, which I pushed back against, but it was kind of a hot topic back then. So I realized that it was very hard to define my topic. Um, I was just trying to find out, you know, conservatism, what even is it? And so struggling with that for a while, we came up with that answer. And uh, Verlin started graduate school a little bit after I did. And he was kind of asking the same questions. And so he looked at it. I'm a historian. He's a political scientist. So I looked at it from a historical angle. He looked at it from a political science angle. And then we continued to flesh things out. We were both visiting scholars at Stanford at the same time. And so when we were there, we continued to kind of um, collaborate more. And then as it took book form, uh, we decided to combine our forces and, uh, and work with Oxford University Press to get it published. Does that sound good, Verlin? Yeah. So, um, so your book, I mean, people have this conception of the left and the right where, you know, the left has a particular worldview and the right has a particular worldview and these worldviews are different. And what makes you left or right is whether you agree with this worldview or that worldview. And you're intervening in that picture and you're saying, no, that is, that's totally wrong, actually. 
What it is is that it's much more like uh, it's actually the opposite. It's that people first associate with a tribe based on where they're born, their family, their community, et cetera, much like you would a sports team. And then they adopt all of the beliefs of that tribe. And therefore the beliefs can, you know, change significantly over time. There's no core to the left. There's no core to the right. This is all totally arbitrary. So I, you know, I think I go part of the way towards your, your thesis, maybe not fully, but I'd like to kind of hear you make the case first because I, I, I agree that people are operating on this assumption where the left is like a worldview, leftism, liberalism, progressivism. People have nouns that seem to describe a, wor- a worldview that is um, fairly malleable and conservatism, you know, people don't really say rightism, but conservatism, um, so make the case to a skeptic. Why is it that, why is it the reverse of what people think it is? Yeah, thanks, Coleman. And you're exactly right. This is the most um, dominant intellectual framework for discussing politics in the 21st century. If you turn on cable news, if you open up a newspaper, if you have a conversation with anyone about politics, inevitably those words left and right, liberal and conservative, are going to come into the conversation. Um, But as we examined this intellectual framework, we found that it's just completely false, that there's actually no evidence in any of the literature for thinking about politics in this way. Uh, Most obviously, a left-right framework assumes a unidimensional ideological spectrum, which assumes that there's only one issue in politics. Now, that seems to be on its face a false idea. There's hundreds of issues in politics. Why would we think there's only one issue in politics? Now, what typically people come back to us when we say that, that there's only one, that there's more than one issue in politics, they say, yes, that's true, but there is one essence that binds together all of the hundreds of issue positions that go under the umbrella of left wing. And there's one essence that binds together all the hundreds of issue positions that go under the umbrella right wing. And it is true that among a certain segment of the population, Um, generally college-educated citizens in this country, you can find some bundling together of issue positions that go together in a way that we might call liberal or we might call conservative. Uh, But the question is why. Why does someone who is pro-life on abortion policy also um, in favor of tax cuts and also uh, in favor of the Iraq war, but against military aid to Ukraine Um, and in favor of free trade and um, against legalization of marijuana, but in favor of gun rights. Why do all of these things go together? They seem very different from each other. What's the logical connection behind these things? And most people would say there's some essence, that there's some philosophy of progressivism or conservatism that binds together all these issue positions. So we examine that claim and we find that there's just no uh, evidence for it. And instead, we find evidence for what you pointed out there, which is the social theory uh, w- that we put forward in our book, which is that people anchor into an ideological tribe called left or right, and for reasons of socialization, either parents or peers or an issue that they really care about, and then they adopt all the other positions of the tribe to which they belong. Uh, so they do this for reasons of, of socialization. Uh, not for reasons of philosophical expediency. We know this because, well, there's lots of evidence that we look at in the book. We look at historical evidence, we look at survey data, we look at experimental research. They all show that the very meanings of left and right will change over time as the tribe changes. That it's not philosophical coherence, it's um, social expediency and tribalism. So I think there's um, there's a few things to say. One is that I, I definitely agree with your thesis in part and the compelling evidence for it is just the fact that yesterday's right-wing positions often become today's left-wing positions so you I mean you can look at this on many different issues you you actually already mentioned one which is foreign policy if you wind the clock back 20 years to the Iraq war the right would have been quote unquote pro-war and the left would have been quote, anti-war. 
And it would be easy to think, well, that's just the essence of the left. You know, the, it, the left is Noam Chomsky. It's, uh, you know, it's Vietnam War protests. That's just what it means to be a leftist. And the right just is neoconservatism and American empire, right? And then you fast forward to 2023, and all of a sudden it's Tucker Carlson, um, you know, sounding like Noam Chomsky. And it's the left and, and Biden, you know, say, sounding like the neocons of old and saying, you know, we just have to support Ukraine and support right and Vladimir Putin's a thug. It was like right, right now the left is the one saying Putin's a thug and that's all that matters. 20 years ago, the right was saying Saddam's a thug and that's all that matters. So really the parties have switched on that issue. Um, and, you know, on the issue of markets, again, that's something you could easily think is inherent to the right. The right is just inherently pro-free market. The left is inherently pro-social democracy and uh, market regulation and in intervention and so forth. But then you look at, you know, when Trump came along and just destroyed decades of precedent on the right uh, of, of uh, by being pro-tariff and, and hard on China and, and also isolationist and pretty much the whole, the whole right just kind of snapped into alignment with that. And the left snapped into alignment suddenly on the other side, which suggests that those particular positions were not at all inherent to the right or the left. Uh, so when I see things like that, I'm very tempted to agree with your thesis that there's nothing to this concept of the right and the left. They're just essentially like being born in New York. So I'm a, I'm a Mets fan. And if you're born in Boston, you're a Red Sox fan. It's not that I have some deep preference for the philosophy of the Mets. It's just like, this is what it is to be born into a thing. Um, on the other hand, there does seem to be, uh, uh, I, I can very much see the other side of this too. So for example, what do you make of, of heritability studies, right? Because when you, when you separate I identical twins at birth and they're raised in different places, my understanding is there, there is still a degree to which they are more likely than pure chance to end up with the same politics, which tells me there you've like separated the variable of, of where they're born and it, what, into what community they're born. But it seems like their default settings, their factory settings lead them in a way that is greater than randomness towards a particular ideology. So what do you make of the heritability of politics? Yeah. So you pointed out, you know, it's almost like you're born somewhere, you're born in New York, therefore you become a Mets fan. You're born in Utah, so you become a Utah jazz fan. Um, that analogy can only take us so far. And the reason being is what you pointed out is that what causes us to anchor into the tribes in the first place is not completely random. It's not just where you're born. So there are psychological dispositions. Now, the way the political scientists and psychologists have interpreted this is incorrect. They say they're psychological dispositions to liberalism and conservatism. As you know, by reading our book, liberalism and conservatism, we don't believe exist. Um, what we find is what they're calling liberalism and conservatism is simply one position associated with liberal or conservative. So we do find, for instance, people who um, are born with the disposition of homosexuality are much more likely to be liberal. Well, why is that? It's not that they're born with a disposition to be against tax cuts and be uh, in favor of more COVID restrictions and born with a disposition to be against the Iraq war. It's that there's one issue, gay rights, that is more associated with the left-wing tribe. And so they're more likely to join the Democratic Party, anchor into that tribe, and adopt the rest of the mm. positions. We do find that people are born with, some people are born more individualist, more libertarian, more get out, get out of my way, don't bother me. And so those people, if you believe strongly in free markets, you're going to anchor into the right wing tribe. Now, what do those free markets have to do with abortion? What do they have to do with drug restriction? What do they have to do with invading Iraq? The answer is nothing. But having a disposition, disposition to one issue is sufficient to get you to anchor into a tribe and adopt the rest. So it's as if, let's say I was a huge fan of LeBron James, just love LeBron James, love the way he played. Um, that's enough to get me to anchor into the L.A. Lakers tribe and then start cheering for Anthony Davis and all the rest of the Laker players. 
um, even if it's just LeBron James I care about. So yes, one issue is sufficient to get us to anchor in. And of course, once you've anchored in, then you'll make up a story. So people who anchor into the left-wing tribe say, our tribe is about social justice. And so they'll make up stories. So can you make up a social justice story about opposing the Iraq war? Absolutely. How dare you invade the sovereignty of the poor Iraqis? How dare you send, you know, the poor Americans, uh, you know, poor people are more likely to be in the military. It's socially unjust that you're sending them abroad to die. And then can you make a social justice argument for invading Iraq? Sure. How dare you leave the Iraqis under the, you know, under the whims of a dictator? How dare we enjoy our freedoms at home, but be selfish and not share those with others? Social justice dictates we invade. So you can make an argument, a social justice argument for every position uh, that anyone's going to take. And that's ultimately what these tribes have, is ex post stories. They think they start with philosophies. They think they start with an ideological position like social justice, and I'm born believing in social justice, and then I adopt all of these positions because I believe in social justice, and then I, anch- and then I finally join the tribe that agrees with me. We find that that's exactly opposite. People anchor into the tribe first, maybe because psychologically they're in tune with one particular issue, and then they adopt the other positions as a matter of socialization. And then the ideology is just the story they tell themselves after the fact to justify what they've done. It's a lot like uh, it's, it's it has a lot in common with astrology. When you say it has a lot in common with astrology, what, what do you mean by that? Well, because people think so if, if I if let's take Senator Elizabeth Warren, if I was to talk to her and said um, you're in favor of a woman's right to choose, she say that's right. I'd say, you're also in favor of raising taxes on the rich. she said, that's right. I'd say, why do you have those two issues? She would say, it's because I believe in social justice. So those two issues are naturally connected. If somebody is a progressive like me, says Senator Warren, I'm naturally going to have those two positions because both of those promote social justice. That's what drives me to them. She's, that's the story she's telling ourselves. The reality is that they're not connected. Same thing, if I go to an astrologer, I walk in and I say, hey, I was born in August. The astrologer, astrologer will say, well, you're a Leo and that means you're brave. She's saying that being born in August and being brave are naturally connected. Mm-hmm. Now, what would she use as her evidence? The same evidence that Senator Warren would use. The, 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 story, the astrologer would start telling stories. If I had been in the military, the astrologer would say, how brave of you to join the military and put your life on the line for your country. If I hadn't been in the military, the astrologer would say, how brave of you to oppose unjust wars and to stay out mm-hmm. of these evil conflicts that you don't believe in. So it's heads I win, tails you lose. And right. you find political people doing the exact same thing. If one minute they're opposed to war, they say, well, social justice dictates I'd be opposed to war because wars are unjust. And then in the next minute, their tribe is in favor of war. And they say, well, social justice dictates that we have to fight for human rights and all these kinds of things. So any position can be swallowed up under the story of social justice. Yeah. If I could just jump in there, I think, you know, it's like astrology because it's based on post hoc storytelling instead of prediction, right? So Mm -hmm. science is based on making predictions and falsifying hypotheses, but that's not what the people who come up with the essences behind left and right are doing. They're just telling post hoc stories. And it's, it's also, if I can add on what Hiram was saying earlier about these correlations between personality types and, and identifying with these tribes it's actually only on the margins. It's not overwhelmingly strong correlations. It's really just um, among a small slice of the population who's been socialized into left-right thinking, which we think is one of the most powerful evidences that we provide in the book for the fact that left and right are social constructs. They don't exist in nature. Because you think about it, the only people who bundle issue positions together in this way are people who have been told that, the, that this issue goes with that issue in this particular way, right? People who are not college educated, who have not been told that these things go together, simply do not hold their issue positions in these particular bundles. It's almost as if um, you found the correlations that Hiram was talking about with astrology, like bravery among Leos, only among the people who daily read their horoscope and really believed in astrology. It's simply a product. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. People have been socialized into this way of thinking, but it doesn't exist in nature. We know this, of course, because left and right emerged at a particular time and place in the 1780s in Paris. And it was confined to Europe for about a century. It came to America in the 1920s. For most of American history, we never thought about politics in terms of left and right. We never talked about politics in terms of left and right. It's a relatively recent historical phenomenon. As we show in the book, it's actually doing a great deal of harm. We'd be better off if we jettisoned this intellectual framework. So, isn't it still nevertheless true? And I, this I actually don't know. Don't know this. Maybe you know this, but 
the um, the twin studies which, which show that identical twins separated at birth are, are more likely than not to share the same politics, that would probably presumably hold true even for non-college educated people, right? E- even if it's, there may just be some instinct that is partly genetically determined that does lead one to like one party more than the other. And then if that's true, the question is, is why? And, and another way of asking this is, so you, you sort of concede that caring about one issue, right? The LeBron James in, in your analogy, caring about that one issue can, that can be a, a genuinely felt view and then it just, the rest of the party politics snaps into alignment because of tribalism when you may have no real view on any of the other 99 issues. But what, what determines why you care about that first thing and, and what your view is on that first thing? Is there, is there something in there that captures some degree of, of what it means to be left or right? No, because it'll be different things, right? So there's, so let's say there was, uh, you know, you talk about these twin studies. And by the way, uh, those would falsify our thesis if you found that independent of socialization, twins were winding up at the same place. But you don't. I mean, you look, you know, twins adopted internationally and their politics are all over the place, right? So if, if you have one twin stays in China and the other twin comes to the United States, mm-hmm. um, you're going to see their politics uh, diverging completely. So mm-hmm. it, it, that goes against it. But if you found them having the same views, one in China, one in the United States, and whoa, the person who is in favor of higher taxes, both of them are in favor of higher taxes, more abortion rights, more COVID restrictions, all these kinds of things. Well, then you'd say, well, okay, then they do go together naturally independent of socialization. But in fact, you don't. So you could, for instance, have, um, you know, you have these twin separated birth. Maybe they just have a, a, a really dominant psychological disposition towards xenophobia. Uh, they're just scared of immigration. Well, they're going to, they're going to anchor into Donald Trump's party. They're going to anchor into his tribe. And then they're going to start wearing the MAGA hats. And then they're going to adopt the anti-free trade stuff. And then they're going to adopt the nationalism stuff. And then they're going to adopt, uh, you know, kind of the anti-tech stuff. They're, they're going to adopt the whole range because of one issue. It could be a different issue. Let's say there was twins born with a disposition towards free markets. And they had a, both of the twins, they're genetically identical. And therefore, this dominant trait of being in favor of free markets well, then they're going to, you know, anchor into the right wing tribe and adopt its other things. So it, it can be any number of issues. Now, what does immigration restriction have to do with free markets? The answer is nothing. And if you look at free market economists, in fact, they have opposite psychological correlates. But the anchoring, the, regardless of the issue, will get you to the same place once the socialization kicks in. And since these twins raised apart, nonetheless, share a same socio ideological environment, the same American context that says these things go together, well, naturally, they can wind up in the same place party-wise and bundle position-wise because they share a sociological context. Mm. I I might also just jump in there um, about this idea of of nature versus socialization. If it were true that um, these uh, twin studies right, show that raised in different places in the same country with the same political tribes, they end up anchoring the same tribe because of their belief in these hundreds of issue positions that they are predisposed to adopting. They just so happen to align with one of our two political parties. What are the chances? If that were really true, then we would see them flip-flopping back and forth between the two parties throughout their lives. Because as you just said, Coleman, the two parties are constantly changing their positions, right? So you, you talked about you know, in the 2000s versus the 2020s on foreign policy, how the two parties switched. But that wasn't the first time. It's happened a dozen times in the past century that the two parties have switched on foreign interventionism. Mm. They've switched on free trade. They've switched on abortion policy. They've switched on every single issue you can go down the line. So if it was really principled people that care so much about this philosophy that's informing all of their issue positions, they would jump back and forth between the parties throughout their lives. But that's not what we see so in these twin studies. Is it possible that there are some issues like foreign policy, taxation, et cetera, which are just total tribal badges that can flip flop back and forth? But nevertheless, there are some issues that seem to remain constant. So, for example, um, I may be wrong about this and, and I'm happy to be shown to be wrong, but I'm unaware of any right wing throughout the past, let's say, 150 years 
whether in Europe or America, that was pro-homosexuality while the analogous left wing of that country was anti. So it w- would that, I mean, I'm curious, one, do you agree with that? And two, is it possible that there are certain issues that are carved out, which really are stable and reflective of some kind of right left binary, like, like, um, attitudes on homosexuals? So, uh, so would you consider the Chinese communist party left wing or right wing? I guess, uh, well, I guess I would have to consider it left wing. Right. But the, yeah, but the I mean, right, but the, regimes, but the, the right was not pro homosexuality, right. In China before, before it was beat. Right. So like, I know, okay, I know, yeah. like I would expect to find at least one example where right and left switched on homosexuality, but I don't, I don't think there are any. Yeah. So, I mean, would you consider Franklin Roosevelt left wing or right wing? Left. Okay. So he's, he got famous in American politics for prosecuting homosexuality in the Navy. That's how he, was, he served uh, in the Wilson administration, which was supposedly progressive. And that was, a left-wing cause, uh, those who were right-wing in the 1930s um, were much less opposed uh, to prosecution of homosexuality, were much more in favor of gay rights in America in the 1930s. They tended to be um, atheists, people who were opposed to the New Deal. Uh, people who were pro-New Deal, who were on the left, were tended to be much more um, Christian. You know, this was Southern mm-hmm. Protestants, um, urban Catholics, uh, had much more traditional social views uh, than than Republicans on the right in the 1930s. But of course, that changed uh, in the 1970s and 80s. I mean, think about, you know, abortion is another one that we get where people say, well, this is the real core issue that defines the the two parties. But if you think about every single Republican Party presidential candidate of our lifetimes, they've had to change their position on abortion. Why? Because the party changed its position on abortion. Go to, you know, Donald Trump, Mitt Romney, John McCain, whoever you want to go to, they've all changed their position on abortion because the two parties flip-flopped on that issue. There's no core issue that divides our two parties or uh, left or right. Um, I want to read to you... um, I want to read to you my summary from an uh, an article I wrote about Thomas Sowell's book, A Conflict of Visions. A Conflict of Visions, uh, I'm sure you're aware of it, but it's, it's basically a book that is pretty much the opposite of your thesis. It's his, basically his best effort to summarize what is essential to the left and essential to the right. So I'm just going to, I'm going to read this to you and get your reaction. Okay. Sowell begins the book by observing a strange fact. People predictably line up on opposite sides of political issues that seemingly have nothing in common. For instance, knowing someone's position on climate change somehow allows you to predict their views on taxing the rich, gun control, and abortion. Now, it's tempting to dismiss this as mere political tribalism, but Sowell says that there's more at work, that there are two fundamental ways of thinking about the social world, two sets of basic assumptions about human nature, and two conflicting visions from which most political disagreements follow. He names these the constrained vision and the unconstrained vision. The constrained vision underlines his book, Knowledge and Decisions. It says that humans are inherently more flawed than perfectible, more ignorant than knowledgeable, and more prone to selfishness than altruism. Good institutions take the tragic facts of human nature as given and create incentive structures that without requiring men and women to be saints or geniuses, still lead to socially desirable outcomes. A good example is the price mechanism as described by Hayek. Centralized power is treated with suspicion as the humans who wield it will be self-interested or worse. What's more, in the constrained vision, traditions and social mores are trusted because they represent the accrued wisdom of untold generations. As for the unconstrained vision, if humans are flawed, selfish, and ignorant, It's not due to the facts of human nature, but to the way our society happens to be arranged. By reforming our economic system, our education system, our laws, and other institutions, we can change the social world in fundamental ways, including those aspects of it that are purportedly fixed 
by human nature. Through enlightened public policy, often implemented by a central authority, evils once assumed to be inevitable are revealed to be social constructs or products of outdated ideas. Tradition should receive no special reverence in this vision, but should live or die according to their rationality or lack thereof as judged by modern observers. So that's Thomas Sowell's, uh, Thomas Sowell's view of what is, and again, I don't think that he actually uses the concept of right and left per se in, in that, uh, in that book very much, but he calls it constrained and unconstrained. Um, Steven Pinker calls it the tragic view and the utopian view that there are these different pictures of human nature, uh, changeable on the one hand and fixed on the other that that inform quite a bit of uh, um, our attitudes towards politics. So what do you make of that view? Well, Thomas Sowell is a genius and one of the great thinkers of our time, and we just couldn't disagree more. Again, he's trying to make the claim that politics is about one thing, and it's simply not. It's manifestly not. There are many, many unrelated issues. Um, so where to begin with his constraint versus unconstrained? First of all, it's a straw man characterization. I have yet to meet somebody on the left who says, yep, Sowell nailed it. I don't believe in reality. I can't confront reality. I, I don't have a constrained vision. I'm a utopian. I, you know, this is, it's like the people on the left who say, well, the right wing is defined by selfishness and greed. When was the last time you, because you hear this all the time. Every time I talk to a leftist, they say the fundamental difference between left and right is those on the left care about social justice and those on the right want to uphold privilege and power hierarchies. I have never not once, not for two seconds, encountered a conservative who said, yeah, that's right. I believe in upholding power and, and prestige and, and, and so forth. It's just, it's a straw man characterization. Furthermore, every single position of the left, you could spin a story. So, so Sowell spins the story that all the positions of the right are, are realist and, and come from a constrained vision. You could spin the same story around the positions on the left. I've seen people do it. Uh, George Stephanopoulos, for instance, he says, the reason I'm on the left is because I have a constrained vision. I, I believe people are, 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 are imperfect and we have to deal with those human imperfections. So those on the right, they are utopians. They think that we can just get government out of the way and everything will turn out fine. I, on the other hand, have this constrained vision. I live in a reality that says, no, we have to have a welfare state. We have to have these institutions. We have to compel people to be good because on their own, they won't be good. So, and then furthermore, I mean, look at the Iraq war. George W. Bush stands up in one of the most famous you know, speeches of all times and says, my goal is to end tyranny in the world. If that isn't the unconstrained vision, I, I don't know what would be. So the bottom line is, and again, if, if unconstrained vision is what defined the left, then they all would have been cheering and going along with George W. Bush. Hallelujah, bringing freedom and democracy to the world. We are the people who are unconstrained that believe this kind of thing is possible. We're going to bring heaven on earth. Why weren't they? Because it has nothing to do with the constrained versus the unconstrained vision. It has to do with tribe. And George W. Bush was not on their team. Now, when FDR was making those kind of claims, of course, people on the left supported war because FDR was on their team. Of course, in 1916, when Woodrow Wilson was making those claims, people on the left, you know, because it's all about tribe. So when the left wing tribe is going to the war, left wingers support it. When the right wing tribe is going to war, right wingers uh, left wingers oppose it. It really is that simple, and you can see it in the historical record. So why did this one-dimensional view of politics take hold? Why are people even as smart as Thomas Sowell believing this idea that there's just one issue in politics when it's manifestly absurd because there's many issues? The reason we give is that in the 1930s, politics was, at least on the national level, national level really was about one big issue. It was the New Deal. There was more government on the left, and there was less government on the right. Questions about abortion, military intervention, nationalism, immigration, racism, all the rest of that stuff was nowhere to be found. In fact, when you polled people, liberals were far more racist than were conservatives. But segregation, that was not an issue on the table. So you were on the left and you were a liberal, liberal if you supported the New Deal. So all these Southern segregationists were considered in the 1930s liberal. So that's why the political spectrum took hold, because it used to work. It used to be a handy way to measure the one big issue of more versus less government control of society. And, and so once it took hold, then as new issues came online, people like Thomas Sowell started trying to fold them in and trying to make up stories to show how they all fit. Mm. But what we should have done is said, OK, politics is no longer about one thing. We got to get rid of the unidimensional model and just talk about mo issues individually. Instead of saying Donald Trump has moved the Republican Party to the right, whatever that means, more government, less government, who knows, simply say where he stands. He's more nationalist. 
He believes more in immigration restriction. He, he's less in favor of free trade and so on and so forth. So talk about where people are instead of pretending there's one issue like Thomas Sowell does, unfortunately, in his book. I think also to, to add to your point, you, um, you're, you know, you're arguing against a, a fallacy that is actually not even present in many places of the world. So, for example, if you live in Puerto Rico or Israel, there, there is one issue. Right in, in Puerto Rico, the parties are not, are defined by what the status of the island of Puerto Rico should be. There's a statehood, pro statehood party, which is the right wing party, and there's a pro status quo Commonwealth party, which is the left wing party. There is no sense in which taxes is a right left issue. All of these other issues that we associate with the right and the left are non existent in terms of being polarized. They, they exist as issues in Puerto Rico, but they are, but they are not associated necessarily with, with those things. And if you go to Israel and you ask them, what's the essence of the right and the left, they will tell you the Palestinian issue. That is, that is the cleaving line between to define an Israeli leftist from an Israeli rightist. And I think your book probably would not even make very much sense to those audiences because they would say, well, of course – Right. And so and so in some in some way, it's a particularly American and, and recent fallacy that all of these issues must somehow be aligned. And it it reflects the fact that America, I think, is in such a secure position that we have so many things to fight about, whereas many places in the world there there's one there's one issue because it is the over, overarching issue, issue of a particular society. And obviously in Taiwan, it is the China issue, right? Um, at the same time, I'm still, I'm still a little bit hesitant to go all the way to your point of view, because um, is there not research that psychologists say is very valid on the big, big five personality traits that is not that like if your thesis were 100% true and there was nothing to the notion of left and right, then wouldn't we expect to see that the big five personality traits are exactly the same among the left and the right because all the random variances would cancel out? And yet, don't we see that there are some differences on these big five personality traits like openness to experience and neuroticism and and all the rest uh, that they are not identical between left and right is that is that the case or am I am I wrong to say that? Yeah, so these um, personality studies are, are really interesting, and I think they are um, a good example of uh, social science malpractice. And a lot of uh, scholarship is coming out showing why some of these were so poorly done. Uh, so, for example, some of the earlier scholarship, I think Mark Hetherington and others were involved in showing how okay, look, we can measure people's personality types about openness to change or fearful of change, right? They're, they're afraid of things or they're open. And we can measure them on some scale, right? Some authoritarian scale. And then we can match that up to their identification with liberalism or conservatism. Um, but of course, what these scholars did is they cooked in the results by the way that they asked the questions. Uh, so they asked questions like, um, how afraid are you of Islamic terrorism? How afraid are, of you, um, are you of homosexuality? How afraid are you of all these things that were prime, obviously, conservatives or people who had that particular uh, bundle of issue positions at that particular time to say that they were very afraid of these things and that people who identified as liberal to show that they're, oh, they're very open towards these things. Uh, but once you change the questions being asked, or at least uh, balance them between what you might expect from the two major political parties based on their issue positions, that entire difference disappears. Mm. Right. So I remember during um, you know the Bush administration, uh, so many political scientists were saying, well, really, the, the big essence of conservatism is they're afraid. And that's why we are doing the Iraq war, because Bush and the conservatives are afraid of terrorism. And they're so afraid that they're willing to start a war in the Middle East. And they're so afraid that they're willing to pass all of these domestic surveillance laws to make sure that there's no terrorism. They're willing to give up their freedoms because they're afraid. Conservatives will give up freedom and engage in foolish wars because they are afraid. That's the one major 
essence behind conservatism. Well, we fast forward just a decade and we come to the COVID epidemic and which of the two major political parties and ideological tribes was more afraid. And it was Team Blue that was so afraid of the coronavirus and was willing to give up freedoms and willing to go along with the lockdowns and willing to do all these things because they were so afraid. And it was Team Red that was saying, enough with the lockdowns, live and let live, who cares about the coronavirus, it's not that bad, you know, all this kind of stuff. It wasn't fear versus openness, it just depended um, on the issue. So I think um, uh, those issues uh, are really interesting in revealing what happened with that scholarship, but I'll let Hiram chime in there too. Well, yeah, I mean, the openness one is really interesting because, you know, again, <laughs> when people assume a unidimensional spectrum and assume an essence, they premise their research on it and they get all they get misleading results. So what they did is they asked about openness to experience, and then they asked about where are you, conservatism and liberalism, assuming these are fixed, you know, essential categories. And they found that people were more open or more liberal. Well, there you go. Liberals are more open. There we got it. The essence is openness. Well, once you get rid of this whole idea of left and right and just ask about individual issues, you find that when it comes to the economic realm, conservatives are way more open. Openness to experience that, you know, personality trait you were talking about earlier correlates very highly with economic freedom. People who are open-minded are less likely to be in favor of minimum wages, heavier welfare state, government regulation of the economy, all these things. So once you break it down issue by issue, these studies actually support our position, showing that whether, whether you know, openness leads to liberalism or conservatism is totally misconceived. It depends on the issue. It's domain dependent. And that when we break it down, we find that these things don't correlate. If you're an open minded person, you're going to agree with some things that are currently in the basket of policies we call left and some things that are currently in the basket of policies we call right. Um, one of the main people on this, you probably have had him on your show, Jonathan Haidt. Mm-hmm. You know, he was talking about these personality traits and personality types. And he he used to think that, you know, like disgust, that's a conservative personality trait. Now, why did he believe that? Because these people did studies and they put issues of like, I don't know, uh, they talked about abortion. Who's more disgusted with abortion? Oh, conservatives are. Look at that. Who's more disgusted with atheism? Well, look yeah, at that. They, just, they conveniently are. didn't put like a like a, a white racist on that list and, and ask who's more it, disgusted. Exactly. Right. Who's more disgusted with gun violence? Who's more right. disgusted with? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You got it. Yeah, no, this is... But but uh, Haidt has, I think, backed away from some of those earlier claims as he's seeing that these things are domain-specific. Yeah. Um, does your theory explain why someone born and socialized into one tribe would switch tribes? Yes. <laughs> because, yeah, so well, let me, in, sorry, in before you talking, answer, let me just yeah. flesh that out slightly more. So... I know very few people, almost none, not none, but almost none that were say like born in New York, raised a New York Yankees fan. And then when they were like late teens or early twenties actually said, I just, something about the Red Sox speaks to me much more. I'm now a Red Sox fan. Whereas I know more people still not wait, you know, too many, but I definitely know more people who were born into say a right wing family in a right wing community and then really began at some point identifying more with left left wing views or vice versa, which would suggest to me that there is there is something about the positions of the other party or maybe maybe it just could be one position which really spoke to them and made them switch and override their tribal programming more often than is the case in cases of like pure 100% tribalism. Yeah, and I think you're right that the metaphor here of sports teams is is useful. So we were talking earlier about, you know, say um, if you're a Cavaliers fan and your franchise drafts LeBron James and he brings home a, a title to the Cavaliers, right? You love LeBron James. Well, he tra- he switches teams and he goes to the Lakers. Now all these Cavaliers fans are booing him when he comes back, right, to Cleveland. Um, because they care more about the jersey and the team, and that's what they really care about, more than the individual players. And um, and now Lakers fans, who used to hate LeBron James, remember, now they love LeBron James. Why is that? Because he switched jerseys. There is a rare person who just loves LeBron James and will cheer for the Cavaliers when he's on that team and cheer for the Lakers, when he's on that team. And those are the people that you're talking about in terms of switching 
um, ideological tribes switching teams. And these are exceptions to the rule that, that prove the rule. So there are some people who really care about particular issues. And if their tribe changes their position on that issue, they won't go along with their tribe. Right. That's unusual. Most people just go along with their tribe. But occasionally people will care more about a particular iteration of their ideology and will change teams. And so we've seen this historically. We talk about it in the book, right? So in the 19th century, liberalism used to mean free markets, free trade, limited government, laissez-faire economic policy. In the 20th century, it changed to mean the opposite, more government intervention, a larger welfare state, all of these things. It was rare, but there were some people who said, no, I'm, I'm a liberal, right? I mean, people uh, like Robert Taft and Herbert Hoover continue to call themselves liberals uh, till the end of their days because they said, no, this liberalism means free markets. It means less government intervention in the economy. And there were people that formed the American Liberty League in the 1930s and switched from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party because the two parties switched on this issue of government intervention in the economy. They just really cared about it. Now, they were the exception. Most people who had used had previously been free market people, free trade people, just went along with FDR's transformation of liberalism in the Democratic Party. They continued to call themselves Democrats and liberals, and they just went along with all those changes. But some people changed. Something similar happened in the 1960s. Um, there was a lot of Democrats who were hawkish on foreign policy. They were anti-communist foreign policy. You know, this is the party of Truman and JFK and LBJ. They're all for all that foreign policy. Um, but when the anti-war movement emerges within the Democratic Party and the new left changes the meaning of left and changes the meaning of liberalism and what the Democratic Party stands for, some of them switched tribes. They called themselves neoconservative to distinguish themselves from the old conservatives because they felt like the Democratic Party had left them and they had to move into um, a new political party. I mean, Ronald Reagan famously said, I didn't leave the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party left me. He was willing to stick to a particular iteration of his philosophy rather than go along with the transformation. Yeah, so th this goes along with your guys' argument that um, this notion of the right has moved rightward and the left has moved leftward, that that is actually a deep conceptual fallacy, that it, it, it's not just wrong, that it doesn't mean anything. So this is a claim that lots of political scientists have made, and you'll, you'll see, in fact, this is Elon's um, infamous tweet that, you know, one of the many tweets that got a lot of blowback was that he just showed a picture, I think it was a picture of like a person and the left, the left moved to the left so that that person staying in the same place was now essentially on the right. So what can you say about this notion of the right having moved to the right and the left having moved to the left? It's, it's demonstrable nonsense. I, I, I don't know how else to say it. I mean, we're like the kid who's saying the emperor has no clothes. Look, people say that free markets are right wing and extreme right wing means you're extremely in favor, favor of free markets. The Republican Party, by every objective measure, has has promoted big government more than they ever have. I mean, they've expanded the size of government more than any other party in history has done in the last 20 years. And yet people say they moved to the right. So either there is an essence to right and left, and, and small government is a right-wing thing, in, in which case the Republican Party has moved unambiguously to the extreme left. George W. Bush, by that measure, was the most left-wing president in the history of this country without question. So why didn't left-wingers support him? Because it has nothing to do with an essence. It has nothing to do with big government, small government. It has everything to do with tribe. So talking about parties moving left or right on a magic line as if there's simply one issue is just is beyond childish. Is just silly. There are many issues. In the 1950s, it, it, in fact, in the 1990s, when I was growing up, free speech was considered to be left-wing. So if you would have said going to the extreme left, you would have said being extremely in favor of free speech. And yet here we have the Democratic Party now saying that free speech is racist and violent and all these kinds of things, and they're considered to have gone to the left. <laughs> it, no matter what they do, we'll call it a move to the left. If they become more in favor of free speech, it's a move left. Mm. If they become less, less in favor of free speech, it's a move left. So this is a meaningless thing to say. It is unfalsifiable nonsense. And I don't mean nonsense dismissively. I mean it literally. You can't verify it. You can't falsify it. It's an unscientific statement. Yes, it's good uh, rhetorically to get your side anger, angry and fired up about the others. But does it have any content meaning? None. What does it mean that Trump moved the party to the right? Nobody has any idea. All they know is they really, really, really hate Trump. And since I really, really hate him, then he must be extremely bad. And I'm going to use extremely right wing as a synonym for extremely bad. So this is nonsense that people are talking 
There, it, it has nothing to do. If you want to look at actual policies, then we can say, yes, the Republican Party has become more extreme on immigration. True. It's, it's, it's become more anti-immigrant. The Republican Party has become much more favorable to big government. That's also true. What we call these right wing, left wing, I don't care and I don't know. I want to talk about substance. I want to talk about reality. I want to talk about sense. I don't want to talk about meaningless things like left wing and right wing because they are utterly uh, uh, devoid of content. Well, I would just add it's not just meaningless or nonsensical to use these terms left and right, uh, but it's misleading. So when we say that the Republican Party has moved to the extreme right wing uh, over the last several decades, and there's a lot of political science scholarship that purports this, that they show all these um, roll call scaling application data. What they're really showing is that Republicans vote together more often, but they interpret it as meaning the Republicans have moved to the extreme right wing. Oh, wow. So Republicans must have slashed government when they had control of Congress and the presidency. Yeah, back when George Bush had a Republican Congress, I bet government spending must have been halved, right? Or 25% of what it was because it was so extremely right wing. No, doubled. Well, Donald Trump, that extreme right winger, he must have increased government. Uh, or he must have decreased government spending so much and decreased the debt because he's so extremely right wing. No, doubled spending, tripled the deficit, right? And so it's misleading. It tells us things that aren't just nonsensical, but that are untrue. I mean, one of my favorite examples of this is the, uh, the, the much vilified, dreaded Trump tax cuts, which he implemented in, I think, 2017. Evil right wing policy, right? Biden promised on day one, I'm going to absolutely destroy this. And, uh, you know, was, was loved by many on the left for promising to do that, still hasn't done anything about it. You know, basically, you know, Democrats got into power, looked at the Trump tax cuts, secretly said, we actually like this. This is fine for us. <laughs> you know, this is kind of compromised yeah, policy. <laughs> And did nothing about it. And still, people still, uh, I, I think, you know, people just don't really notice moments like that. They, they, don't, mo they don't notice the, the status quo policy that doesn't get changed, even though it, in principle, easily could. And so they... Yeah, we, we talk about in the book, there's the, the difference between rhetoric and policy, which I think you brought up and is a really important point, right? So that you know, Trump can say, oh, I'm going to balance the budget. He campaigned all that. But of course, he did the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, he increased spending, right? Um, so there's that distinction. But then there's also the distinction in time of what people even argue is considered conservative or liberal, right? So tax cuts, people might say to us, well, that's the one issue that really Republicans and current conservatives have always been in favor of. That's that's the defining issue. No, Barry Goldwater, you know, Mr. Conservative, the guy who wrote the conscience of a conservative, the, the first major party presidential candidate who identified as a conservative, opposed the JFK tax cuts. And, and it was the liberals that wanted to cut taxes back in the 1960s. So even something so fundamental as that, the parties are always changing their positions on these issues. And if I may, real quick, what Verlin is getting at here is basically scholars, people who talk about the parties moving rightward or leftward, leftward on a spectrum, it is entirely circular reasoning. It really is. They don't even realize they're doing it. But when, when Goldwater believed in higher taxes and less government spending, they called that extreme right wing. Then along comes George W. Bush and believes in lower taxes and higher spending. They called that extreme right wing. How can we call them both right wing when they're opposite policies? The answer is we just redefine right wing to fit whatever the Republican Party is doing. So claiming the Republican Party is moving to the right is simply saying, and it really is, the Republican Party is behaving like the Republican Party. And yet scholars and pundits latch onto this idea of a rightward move when it's, it's just circular reasoning. We don't fall into this nonsense. If somebody said bachelors are increasingly unmarried, we would all laugh. We would say, that's silly. A bachelor is defined as unmarried. And yet we make the same ridiculous claims and people take it seriously when we say the Republican Party has moved to the right. It's the same circular reasoning. We, do, we just redefine right wing to fit whatever Republicans are doing and then claim Republicans have moved to the right. Yeah, so it, it seems like one of the strongest pieces of evidence for your whole thesis is just flip-flopping and parties changing views, even if they're not flip-flopping, just, you know, st substantially changing on views while still continuing to be defined as right and left. It would seem that by the same token, counter evidence to, to your view would be, you know, right and left really having some stable um, view 
uh, over over a long period of time. And you know, it, it occurs to me just coming back to the homosexuality point, I think um, I would really like to see whether your example of FDR is is just you know an exception that proves the rule, whether or or whether I am radically misled in the way that most people are misled about most positions like tax cuts. Am I radically misled to think that really you know ninety seven percent of right wing parties have had a harder line on homosexuality? Um, uh, over the past, say, you know, hundred years, because you know, is, is there FDR an example? Is is that is that like a is it is that an exception that proves the rule, or is there actually truly no pattern to be found with respect to the party's views on homosexuality? I I would say, yeah, there is no pattern there, simply because it's a new issue, right? Like, if you would have asked in the 1940s, are you in favor of gay marriage? People would have said, what are you talking about? It wouldn't, there wouldn't have been a pattern at all because it just wasn't everyone was against it. Yeah. And it, I, we don't even know because they weren't asking about it. It just wasn't even on the table. So who was more against it or more in favor of it? We're entirely lacking empirical data on that because it wasn't a question they asked. You know, um, it's like, what do you think about covid policy? People would be like, what's covid? Right. So we have no point of comparison cross historical. So that's the main thing is that new issues come online. But looking at the correlates of ideology, when you look in the 1930s, FDR supporters were far more religious than secular. Secular people were far more likely to be identified as right wing. They were more in favor of free markets. Urban areas were more free market and more conservative back then and more secular. So if you look at the demography that supported FDR, it stands to reason that if they had asked the question that those religious demographics would have been much more uh, against homosexuality and homosexual behavior. How do you view the... Um, yeah, I think just... Um, oh, well, I, you know, so... You know, the biggest country in the world, or, or it was until this year, um, in, in communist China. I mean, homosexuality does not map onto left wing, right wing there, right? The Chinese Communist Party is left wing, but they're not in favor of gay rights. Um, you know, Karl Marx, the founder of left wing communism, who could be more left wing than Karl Marx, was not in favor of gay rights. He was personally very homophobic. So, I mean, these things, there's no natural correlation between these uh, different issues. They're just, there's nothing that connects um, your, your views towards homosexuality and your views towards state ownership and the means of production. They're just logically very different issues that have no relationship to each other. I, I think the China case is a bit of a, a tough example to, to really use because, you know, it's a, it's a, almost totalitarian state with no opposition party and no real like polling on people's views. So like if you were to wind back the clock to when, uh, you know, Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong were you know, in a civil war, what would their respective views have been? I don't know, you know, but. Exactly. Because there's no natural court. We can't know because there's no natural correlation between these two things. They were just fighting. They didn't care about that issue. Yeah. It wasn't a part of the left or right spectrum. Right. It, it's not a part of left and right. right. So what do you make of the religious right and Trump? Because this is, this is something that was really you know, puzzling to a lot of people when Trump, you know, Trump literally came to the like, uh, what, what was it? It was like the Christian Families Conference or something, and which is the gathering of evangelicals in Iowa. And interview asked him, do you ever talk to God in front of an evangelical audience that presumably he's trying to court in the most important primary? And he goes, no, I don't really talk to God. When I have a, when I have a decision to make, I, I just try to make the best decision. And, you know, aren't we all sort of bored sometimes listening to sermons in church and the crowd kind of laughs? And he got, in a, you know, a, a huge uh, percentage of the evangelical vote being one of the, to my eye, most obviously non-religious, you know, hostile to family values in his own personal life uh, candidate of our, of my lifetime, certainly. Yeah. And that's why we think our book is so timely because our thesis is being proven every single day. Uh, it's just so visible. 
uh, it was a little more subtle in previous eras, and these changes happen s- more slowly. But right now, it's just happening with e- exceeding rapidity. And some people, especially people who have considered themselves conservatives their whole lives, are looking and saying, my gosh, what's happening? So, so Donald Trump, make, <laughs> I mean, his, his candidacy, in my opinion, and his appearance in the public scene is terrible for our country, but it's been very good for our thesis, and it proves our thesis, and that's why a lot of people are latching on to what we're saying. Because these things that were considered, you know, you keep going back, well, isn't there something bedrock conservative? What about homosexuality? Yeah, people back when Clinton was president would have said, look, gun control can come and go. Free markets, minimum wages can come and go. But character in public officials, we conservatives believe in traditional family values. And the one thing we are never going to compromise on is our biblical understanding of what character is and that it matters. And so all true conservatives will be against Bill Clinton because he is an adulterer. And so what he does in office does not matter. Those are all peripheral, free trade, NAFTA, balanced budget, whatever. Those are peripheral issues. The core conservative issue is character in public officials. And since Bill Clinton is a man of low character, we need to impeach him, and that's the conservative thing to do. Well, along comes Donald Trump, has even worse personal character than Bill Clinton. And what do we see in the polling data? We find that conservatives went from being believing character mattered a great deal to believing it matters almost not at all. It just switched. It, it, it's just like the astrologer telling a new story, uh, the same story to fit the new data. So, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's very clear. Now, what we're not saying, and this is a misunderstanding about our book, is, is some people think, well, you don't think there's any philosophy in politics. You think everybody is just tribal. That's not what we're saying. There's plenty of philosophical people. I consider Coleman Hughes a philosophical person who addresses politics philosophically. I consider Verlin Lewis somebody who addresses politics philosophically. So people can be philosophical. David French, he left the Republican Party. He says, look, Donald Trump, it goes against what I stand for. I'm leaving. He's being philosophical. But what we are saying is that there is no philosophical connection between the many unrelated issues that people consider right wing and left wing. Individuals can be philosophical, but there isn't just one big philosophical issue, left wing or right wing, that defines politics. That's the fallacy. Mm. The fallacy is not that everybody's being tribal. No, some people aren't. But what we see is most people who consider themselves conservatives are, and that's why they switched so readily on so many of their positions, went from believing in character, went from believing in free trade to the opposite point of view on those issues as soon as Donald Trump came along. I might just jump in there. You know, I think what just happened last week um, in Iowa is really telling on this because sometimes what people come back to me when I point out this very clear survey data on self-identified liberals and conservatives on the importance of morality and character in public officials will say, yes, it's true that, you know, Donald Trump has a bad character, but tribe right conservatives support him because he gives them the policies they want. So it's, it's really about the policies and it's the issues. Um, but of course, there's plenty of other Republican candidates that Republican voters could have that would um, have be very pro-life on abortion policy, uh, that would be very pro-traditional marriage on marriage policy, whatever the issue is, um, who don't have the character baggage. Uh, but they boo these figures. You know, so last week, Mike Pence goes to Iowa with Ralph Reed and the Christian Coalition. And you you think, you know, evangelicals, they should love Mike Pence. But because he wasn't willing to go along with the tribe on, you know, the stolen election and wasn't willing to overturn the results of the 2020 election, they booed him. And, you know, they, they, they stormed the Capitol building, you know, yelling, hey, Mike Pence. Uh, it was really all about tribe. It wasn't about policy. It wasn't about issue positions. It wasn't any of that. It was tribalism. So someone could listen to all of this and say, well, the only logical position, if you are a principled person, is not to identify with any particular party, but to identify with whichever philosophical principles you think are the right one, the right ones, and make judgment calls on candidates in, in each case. Um, on the other hand, I could see someone saying, well, it just so happens that one party shares my philosophy to a greater extent than the other party right now at this specific time in history. That may change. And so I'm going to, I'm going to identify with one until I feel that the other party represents my philosophy more strongly. So, so I, I can see, does your thesis undercut the logic of identifying with a party or, or not? 
No, no. It's a very important distinction we make here. So th- the analogy we use is just gro- baskets of groceries. So we have to disentangle party from ideology. Do we have a two-party system? Yes. Is a two-party system good? Probably. I think it's probably the best way to organize uh, politics today. What we are against and what the myth of left to right says is that parties are not baskets. Parties are our philosophies. There is a right-wing party and all of its issues are coherent. And then there's a left-wing party called the Democrats and all of its issues are coherent. That's the myth. So parties, are, it's as if you go to the grocery store and instead of being able to pick your groceries, you know, Coleman goes and he picks some kale, uh, he picks some tortillas, he picks some peanut butter, you know, picking his own groceries. Instead, they're waiting for Coleman out in the front of the grocery store saying, Coleman, which will it be, cart A or cart B? Now, Coleman, being a philosophical fellow, will look and say, you know, cart A, uh, my eating habits, cart A looks a little better to me. So it has things I like, things I don't like, but it has a little more of the things I like, so I'm going cart A. That would be logical. That's doing what you're talking about. That would be reasonable. That's what we want Americans to do when it comes to our parties. They are baskets. Basket A, basket B, basket blue, basket red. Pick which basket has more. That's fine. Belong to the basket that has more. I don't care. That's great. If you want to be a Republican, knock yourself out. Want to be a Democrat, please do it. But what we're asking people not to do is delude themselves that everything in one basket is superior to everything in the other basket because it's all philosophically connected. That's not true. Coleman tried to make some kind of argument saying, well, kale is actually philosophically connected to Twinkies. That's going to be a fool's errand. Don't do it. Say, yeah, it's got the Twinkies. I don't like the Twinkies, but I do like the kale, so I'm buying this basket. I would love to see Republicans say, you know what? I, I, I like the, the free market stuff. Um, I like the immigration restriction, but I'm not on board with the party with the abortion thing. But they have more of the things I like, and I will keep my party at arm's length, and I will be critical of my party on the abortion issue because I think it's in the wrong way. That would be constructive discourse. That would be issue by issue and granular. That would be talking about reality instead of talking about an imaginary line. When we're having fights over imaginary things, we're trying to slay imaginary dragons or talking about the tooth fairy or something. That's what we're doing currently when we talk about left wing and right wing. We're talking about something that doesn't exist. So to talk about parties, yes, they exist and they're real. And talking about party issues, things that each party stands for, and, and talking about, yes, this good, this not so good, that would be constructive and useful. But currently, we're under the delusion that everything the Republican Party believes is right-wing and conservative and philosoph- philosophically connected. That's as silly as astrology. That's as silly as trying to make some philosophical story about why Twinkies and kale are fundamentally connected. And it's not just you know, silly, but it's also harmful. So we think about all the pathologies in our public discourse today and in our political culture, we can see how they're related to this delusion that Hiram just described. Um, Because if you were deluding yourself and telling yourself that everything in your basket flowed out of a good and intelligent philosophy and everything in the other basket flowed out of an evil and benighted philosophy, then you would say, you know, politics isn't about persuasion. It's not about compromise. It's not about, um, you know, good faith discourse like you do on your podcast, this good faith discourse. Instead, politics becomes about destroying the enemy and any means will justify the ends. And that's the kind of politics that we see going on today. The tribalism, the anger, the vitriol, the toxic discourse that all flows out of this delusion that people have that all of their issue positions are correct and all of the issue positions of the other team are wrong. And so politics is simply about destroying your opponents. And and really quick, if I may, I mean, think about it. Look, if we looked at politics in a granular way and understood ideology for what it is, a delusion, then every time I met somebody, I'd be like, okay, here's a new person. They're going to agree with me on some things and disagree with me on others. Every single person is different. Every single person sees things a little bit differently. Every single person has a little bit different background. So we're all going to have a whole bundle of issue positions. I'm going to agree with people on some, disagree on others. And every person, I'm going to engage in kind of that understanding. But currently it's no, 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 you're either on the right, in which case you have the good philosophy, or you're on the left and you have the evil philosophy. And so I've totalized things to divide the world into heroes and villains. Instead of looking at each individual as a person who's going to have some things I agree with and some things I disagree with, you have placed people in good guy and bad guy mode and the lizard brain goes there and it becomes extremely destructive immediately. Okay, so this will be my last question. Uh, and, and this is actually the question I probably get most often from my audience when I do Q and A's, which is, you know, just what advice do you have for talking to people about politics? Because 
it can be a very difficult thing. You know, if you're not, if you're, if you're a hilarious person that can just always crack a good joke, then maybe it's easy to have political conversations with your friends or acquaintances or family members. If you're not blessed with that particular skill, it can just be very, uh, just emotionally cumbersome and tiresome and, and a drag to try to have any kind of policy-based conversations. Because as you point out in the book, you know, you're, you're giving people advice about how they should behave if they were rational and logical. But you also, you know, a big part of your argument is that people don't behave this way. People, by and large, are quite, uh, quite taken in by the tribal delusion that there is a coherent liberalism and a, a coherent conservatism. And so in practice, the people we're meeting most often are people that are taken in by the delusion you're trying to debunk in your book. What practical advice do you have for people? Um, I mean, obviously you're doing your part by writing this book, but what practical advice do you have for people that want to engage in the style that you're suggesting, but are, are surrounded by people that are not, you know, that are not really clued in or, or, and don't want to be clued in to this way of thinking? Well, I would, I would say a couple of things, and then I want to hear what Verlin has to say. Um, I think if you just change the language. So you say most people are stuck in this bad paradigm. If you can just make them rephrase things and somebody says, well, the left or he's moving left. And, and, and you'd say, wait a minute, I don't accept those terms. What do you mean? And, and require them to say something empirical. I think that would improve public discourse. Talk about things on a granular level would diffuse things. Instead of talking about left and right, which doesn't exist, talk about more or less abortion, which does exist. Talk about higher or lower taxes, which does exist. So maybe requiring more specificity in language when you engage in public discourse. I, you know, I might, I might say, if we're going to talk politics, I have to lay some ground rules. And, you're not, and I'm not going to use the terms conservative, liberal, left or right in our whole conversation. And if you wouldn't, too. I think that would really improve things, believe it or not. And then you've probably heard of Julia Gallup's book, The Soldier and the Scout, mm-hmm. um, just embracing more of a scout mindset. What the, the myth of left and right does is the worst thing it does is it gives the delusion of omniscience. Because since it says politics is about one big thing, well, as soon as you've chosen the correct side on that one big issue, the side of social justice or the side of preservation or whatever it happens to be, then the thinking's done. You know everything now. Because since there's one issue, you got the one issue right. Mm. Now you know the correct answer on taxes, abortion, gay marriage, environmental policy. You know it all because you chose the correct side of the one issue. So it, it makes people into soldiers. They believe they're omniscient. They believe they're no, they know everything. What we need much more of is scouts. And getting rid of the political spectrum turns us more into scouts. It makes us humble. There isn't just one issue in politics. There's lots. And so I'll just confess, I really don't know, Coleman, what the best income tax rate should be. I really don't. I want to talk to people. I want to find out. I'm a scout on this. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether the Trump tax cuts were good or bad. I'm willing to listen to to both points of view. What I'm not willing to listen to is to say those tax cuts were fascist because they were right wing. That's completely meaningless. That's not helpful. That is soldier mindset, not scout mindset. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know, Verlin, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with all that. And I would just say if if more people could uh, approach politics the way Coleman Hughes does, I think this country would solve 99% of its problems. I just, um, just having this conversation today with you, just struck by, um, your openness, uh, your humility, your good faith discourse. Um, if everyone could model that, that would be wonderful. And I think it comes because, and I, and I don't know you that well, but I don't get the sense that you identify with one of our two ideological tribes, um, that you're saying, Hey, you know, there's two major political parties. Some, each party has some things that are good and bad about it. Um, and I'm open to learning and being persuaded. I think that's, that's excellent. So it is difficult because as you say, Coleman, most people out there who you have a conversation with on a day-to-day basis, they come in with the soldier mindset. They come in with I'm team blue or I'm team red, and they want to approach conversation in a way that says I'm here to conquer instead of I'm here uh, to learn. And so I think it is a problem. And I, and I find it happening you know, if I say something critical of Team Red, then, oh, you must love Joe Biden and you love everything and you're left wing. No, no, no. no. Uh, or if I say anything, say anything critical of, uh, you know, Team 
Team Blue, then it's, oh, you love Donald Trump and you must be, you know, MAGA. No, not at all. Uh, so people just make all these assumptions because they're assuming a unidimensional spectrum. And so they, if you say one thing about one issue, then they assume every other position on a thousand other things, which is totally false. It's not a good way to proceed. So it is very difficult. But um, given that my own views, and I'm open to changing my views on, on everything, um, given that my own views do not fall neatly into these two baskets, how could they? I mean, the statistical chances of that are just astronomically low. Like, if you, if you thought through every issue, what do you know? I just happen to agree with this ideological tribe on all 1,000 political issues. I mean, it's just insanely um, delusional to think that. Uh, given that fact, I think emphasizing where you can find common ground with each person, because you are going to have, as Hiram said, each person's different. You are going to be able to find common ground with everyone you encounter on some level. And then be able to work um, from from that, but then be able to maybe point out that, look, this issue doesn't necessarily have to go with that issue. Let's just leave aside left right labels, leave leave aside liberal conservative. Just talk about issues. We can use partisan labels. Talk about Republicans and Democrats because that implies something true, which is that these are social groups that are coalitions of people and bundles of issues that don't necessarily have to go together. But once we bring in the ideological language, progressivism, conservatism, left, right, um, then I think we've lost the game and we've lost the discussion. I think one thing that'd be really useful is if, and I actually recall taking a, a quiz of this kind on New York Times during the 2020 Democrat primaries, is to just have a lot of questions about specific policies that are very neutrally framed in a way kind of created maybe by a team of people from across the political spectrum on just hitting 50 issues and asking you what your views on, on, on those issues are, and then giving you a list of candidates of either party that are closest to the answers that you gave. And often you might just be surprised if it's really presented in a neutral way and done well, you might be surprised which candidates that you support. Um, and then there's, there's one other essay that I, I always like and a mantra I keep in my head, which is keep your identity small. I can't remember exactly who wrote this essay, but maybe I'll, I'll find it and link to it. Um, you know, every time you give yourself a label like a liberal or conservative and you, you begin to identify as such, you're saddling your own mind with a constant incentive to defend everything associated with that label and to attack everything associated with the other label. So if you really want to get things right as often as possible, it makes sense to keep your identity as small as possible. And that's why I've, I've never identified as a liberal or a conservative. And when asked party affiliation, I, I identify as an independent, persuadable voter who could picture myself I haven't yet voted for a Republican, but I could easily picture myself doing so. And, and Trump has been my only option thus far. Uh, so, I, yeah, I try to keep my identity as small as possible. And I think hopefully that helps me not get stuff wrong and resist the very powerful pull of, of tribalism. So, yeah, and, you know, we point out in the book that Tribes are inevitable. It's, it's a part of human nature, but there's better and worse tribes. And so we encourage people to find healthier tribes, whether that's, you know, a local service organization, whether that's a neighborhood organization. You know, go have face-to-face -face conversations with your neighbors. Get to know them as human beings instead of, you know, sitting behind a keyboard and lobbying political bombs at people in the comment sections of, you know, news articles. That's what we encourage because... The reason that left and right are unhealthy tribes is because they're false tribes. They're based on a myth. Mm. Okay, so the book is The Myth of Left and Right. And um, I, I highly recommend people get it because it's a, a very important and radical intervention in in the pattern of political conversation, the, the, um, the holding pattern of political conversation that we're currently in uh, as a nation. So uh, thanks so much for coming on my show. And before I let you go, where should my audience go on the interwebs to find you? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter, Verlin Lewis. 
Um, you can find our book at Oxford University Press or at Amazon. Just Google the myth of left and right uh, and you'll find us. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much, Coleman. Great. Thanks, Coleman. That's it for this episode of Conversations with Coleman, guys. As always, thanks for watching. And feel free to tell me what you think by reviewing the podcast, commenting on social media, or sending me an email. To check out my other social media platforms, click the cards you see on screen. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.